Color clash. What is it and how do you avoid it? You may love the ZX Spectrum, you may hate it, but you can't deny that its graphics output is striking. The resolution's fairly high by the standards of the time, but those colours, well, they are vivid, or perhaps just lurid. And they do have the worrying tendency to bleed into each other. This is Colour Clash, or to give it its technical name, a tribute clash. Sprites take on the colours of backgrounds, backgrounds take on the colours of sprites. Now don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of the ZX Spectrum from way back, but even I have to admit that sometimes it does look a bit like a big pile of digital sick. So what's causing it? What's the problem? Well, it's not a bug, it's not a glitch, it's not really bad programming or anything like that. It's working as intended, it's just the way the Spectrum's made. You see, the ZX Spectrum has a resolution of 256 by 192 pixels, and it's split up into a grid of blocks 8 pixels high and 8 pixels wide. And within each of these 8x8 blocks, you can have just two of the Spectrum's eight colours, or attributes, as they're called. You can add a little bit of variety by setting each one of these 8x8 blocks to bright mode, giving you a slightly brighter version of the colours you've selected, although not black, because that's just black. And that's it. That's all you can do. There are no other screen modes, no hardware sprites, nothing. And consequently, when a sprite of one colour moves over a background, say, of another colour, well, something's got to give. The background colour bleeds onto the sprite, or the sprite colour bleeds onto the background. Games developers dealt with this in a few different ways. Some said, oh sod it, make everything as colourful as possible and if it looks like a migraine aura, well it doesn't matter. A few pretended the Spectrum didn't have any colour at all and just made everything monochrome. Some of the better ones worked with the Spectrum's limitations rather than against them and managed to come up with pretty colourful games that still weren't too clashy. And that could be the end of the story, but it's not quite. Since time immemorial, or at least since the mid-80s, programmers have worked on ways to try and overcome the Spectrum's colour difficulties. And while some of these methods were successful, they tended to be quite processor intensive and memory heavy. Some of them relied on features that not all models of the ZX Spectrum had, and they just weren't all that practical for use in games. But in recent years, some programmers have managed to square the circle and come up with techniques that allow for much more colourful graphics but are still quick enough to use in games. To do this, they take advantage of the way the Spectrum draws its graphics on the screen. Like most consoles and computers from this era, the Spectrum's graphics are made up of scan lines or horizontal rows of pixels across the screen. These scan lines are drawn one after the other on the screen to build up the whole picture. It happens pretty quickly, but it's not instant, and if you do it right, you can change the image as it's being drawn. This kind of scanline manipulation was used a lot on machines of this era, particularly the Atari 2600. Here on the ZX Spectrum, it's used to allow more than the standard two colours in those 8x8 blocks. How does it work? Well, it is, of course, pretty complicated. To give you a simplified pricey, you can maximise the colours available by changing the colour palettes of the 8x8 blocks every scanline. So the first scan line on the screen will be drawn as normal, but then quickly, before the next scan line is drawn, you change the two colours of the 8x8 blocks that this scan line is a part of. If you do this for the entire screen, it means the two colour limitation now only applies to every 8x1 pixel block, giving you, well, eight times as much colour, if you want to call it that. In practical application, you can't quite fill up the whole screen with such detailed graphics. Instead, you're limited to a window within it. But it still looks pretty good, I'm sure you'll agree. This is the basis of the Bifrost engine, used in quite a few games recently, developed by a guy named Einar Saukas. Or something like that, pronunciation isn't really my strong suit. Also developed by the same guy is the Nirvana engine. This takes a slightly different tack and changes the colour palette every second scan line. This gives you two colours in every 8x2 pixel block, but it does allow for more of the screen to be filled, in fact nearly all of it. Again, I'm sure you'll agree, it looks pretty good. If you're wondering what I mean by engine, well, I'm talking about a ready-made block of code that does all the hard work of dealing with these multicolor graphics. It's not really useful by itself, but it can be used to make other games with these effects. If he'd have come up with this 30 years ago, I'm sure Einar Saukas would be as fondly remembered as Matthew Smith or the Stamper Brothers. As it is, it's only the retro faithful that really appreciate these breakthroughs in graphics. But for those in the know, it's pretty special. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, have a think about subscribing. It'll do you a power of good, I'm quite sure.